This will be lecture number 25 in our ongoing series on mechanical measurements. You will recall that in the previous lecture, we were looking at the transient response of a U-tube manometer. We also mentioned at that time that we will take a look at transient response of other types of transducers, namely the displacement type, displacement element type and the force balance type which is shown in this slide. We will round it off with a, an example and then we will look at the measurement of vacuum pressures, pressures below the atmosphere and uh, typical vacuum gauges will be the McLeod gauge and then high vacuum measurement requires special, special gauges and we will look at these things and uh, hopefully we will be able to cover the entire thing in this particular lecture itself. So, let us look at the types of uh, pressure gauges we will be looking at as far as the transient response is concerned. If you recall the U-tube manometer or U-tube pressure measuring instrument has a typical second order response. The one which we are going to discuss now which is a displacement element type, yeah, an example is a either a pressure gauge with a diaphragm or a piston and a spring which actually is like the bellows type gauge which we indicated earlier. It is idealized as a piston with a spring. The spring element is actually the bellows itself and the bellows itself during expansion and contraction acts like a displacement element. It is like a piston. So, the generalized indication of the bellows type gauge is to indicate it as a piston moving in a cylinder as is shown here with the spring element being the bellows itself as a spring element and the bellows is restrained at one end and it is allowed to move freely at the other end. So, that is indicated by fixity here and uh, let us see how we are going to use it in practice. We have a pressure in the chamber C which is to be measured using a gauge which is located some distance away in this case it is connected by a tubular element or a coupling element which is in the form of a tube of diameter 2 r naught or radius equal to r naught and length equal to L. So, we have a coupling between the pressure to be measured and the pressure which is indicated by the bellows gauge is shown by C and P respectively. If C is varying with respect to time, P will also vary with respect to time and we want to know what is the relationship between C and P and the displacement which is going to be shown by the spring element. And the displacement is measured from some datum and the movement of the, the piston or one of the one end of the bellows element which is not fixed with respect to the fixed end it is going to move and that is the displacement we are going to measure. So, I have indicated the nature of this measurement in the simple sketch which I have made here. It is essentially the same sketch as I showed in the slide. I have uh, indicated a chamber whose pressure is C which may be varying with respect to time that the coupling element of length L and a cross sectional diameter 2 or not connected to a spring loaded piston as is shown here. The area of the piston is A and then the displacement is measured with respect to some datum may be the point here and I am measuring in this direction. So, the displacement is measured as B. So, let us look at what is going to happen. If the pressure C and the pressure D, so the pressure P, these are different. If the two pressures are not the same, what will happen? If the C is greater than P, some amount of fluid has to move in this direction because there is a pressure gradient along the tube and therefore, a flow will take place in this direction as I indicate there. What is the consequence of this flow? This flow is going to push the piston to the right and therefore, the consequence will be a displacement B. So, we can see that C minus P divided by the resistance offered by the coupling element C minus P divided by R this must be the equal to the mass flow rate because this is by the definition of the resistance. If you remember 
the resistance was defined as the potential difference divided by the current C minus P is the potential difference M dot is the current. So, the ratio was R therefore, I have now cross multiplied I have written C minus P by R equal to M dot and let us see what this M dot is. M dot is nothing but the volume change in the piston because the piston is moving to the right the rate of change of volume multiplied with the density is going to give you M dot. So, it will be rho of the manometric liquid multiplied by the area of cross section multiplied by dB by dt dB by dt. <coughs> so, you can see that the equation has become dB by dt into rho m into a equal to m dot equal to c minus p by r. This can be rewritten slightly in a different fashion. Let us call this equation 1. Suppose the spring has a constant equal to k, spring constant equal to k. We also know that the force opposing the motion is given by p into a is equal to k into b. These are the two equations which govern the problem. P a equal to k times b and c minus p by r equal to rho m a d by b d t. So, now I can combine these two together. So, combine these two and I can write the equation as I do it in the next page. So, c minus if you see here instead of p I will write k b by a k b by a divided by r is equal to rho m a d b by d t or I can further rewrite in the following form r into rho m into a this a also I will multiply there that will become rho m r square r a squared ok divided by k d b by d t. So, I have multiplied by r and multiplied by a divided by k. So, this will give you plus b is equal to c into a by k. This is the Gornick equation. this is the governing equation. I will just physically explain what is happening. If the pressure is different between the chamber whose pressure I want to measure and the pressure in the piston is different, there will be a net flow of the fluid from the chamber to the piston. Of course, if the pressure difference is the otherwise, some amount of fluid will go from the piston, it will go back to the chamber. So, whatever I am saying is for p greater than c, c greater than p, for c less than p the flow will be in the opposite direction. When the flow is in the opposite direction the volume is going to decrease. When the flow is taking place into the piston it is going to increase. So, this is like a suppose there is the pressure is changing sinusoidally or in a periodic fashion sometimes the flow will be into the piston sometimes the flow will be from the from the from the piston side to the chamber side. So, the governing equation is a first order equation, the first order Arne differential equation and you can also see this is B is in let us say meters, d B by d t is in meters per second. This whole thing must be in seconds, this whole thing. and uh, we can identify it with the time constant. So, time constant is seconds I will call it as tau is equal to 
rho m or a squared by k. This is your time constant. <coughs> So, we can split it into two parts as I will do it in the next slide. Next, uh, so tau I can write as r multiplied by rho m a squared by k and this is like a electrical resistance is like the capacitance because a first order system which involves a circuit consisting of a resistance and a capacitance is exactly like this. The fluid flow resistance due to the coupling element is identified with the electrical resistance and the other factor which involves the area of cross section of the pressure gauge or the area of the diaphragm or the area of cross section of the pressure gauge that is coming here, the spring constant is coming here and the density is coming here. This is like the capacitance of the gauge, the electrical capacitance tau equal to r times c well known from electrical analogy. So, we will say this is electrical analogy. Therefore, the way we are looking at it is that when there is a transient pressure applied on the system, some amount of fluid has to move either into the pressure gauge or pressure transducer volume or it has to move out of the pressure transducer volume and that is the where that is where the capacitance of the gauge is going to come in picture, which is a composite variable depending on the density, then the area of cross section. You see that if the density increases more mass flow has to take place, it is proportional to the mass flow mass flow is proportional to the density, the higher the mass, higher the density, higher the mass flow rate and higher the mass flow rate, higher the velocity and so on and so forth. Okay. So, these are all related. The area of cross section becomes larger, that means more volume of the fluid has to move into the gauge to bring out a change and therefore, it is a higher capacity. So, the area, it actually goes to the square of the area and if the spring constant is high, it will reduce the capacitance. If the spring constant is low, it will increase the capacitance. So, you see that k is in the denominator. Very weak spring, it will have to move, it will move by a considerable amount for a given pressure change. If the k is very large, it will move very small amount. So, the capacitance is determined by the density of the fluid, then the area of cross section and also the spring constant. So, you see that the physical quantities which come into the picture are as shown here. Let us look at the at a, at a typical example. So, we have a pressure signal which is fed through a line having an inside diameter of 2 millimeters and a length of 2.5 meter. This is a typical application. The line is connected to a pressure transducer having a volume of 5 milliliters. This is given. Assume that during measurement this volume remains constant. So, let us look at this uh, example by going back after looking at this uh, the wording of the problem, let us go back and see what it means. The line is connected to pressure transducer having a volume of 5 millimeters, assuming that during the measurement this volume remains constant. So, this is a different type of application. Air is at 1.2 bar and 30 degree Celsius this is the transmitting fluid and we calculate the time constant of the system in this particular case. Then the second part says is this arrangement suitable for measuring a transient which is cycling at 100 hertz and how do you come to your conclusion regarding the answer to this particular part. So, let me go back and see what the arrangement is. The arrangement is slightly different. This is what we considered just a little while ago we had a pressure C coupling element, a spring and a piston arrangement. The next arrangement I am looking at is a force balance element. This is slightly different from that. In this case what I am doing is, I am connecting the pressure which is to be measured C through a coupling element 
to a gauge which also has a diaphragm element, but what I do is I make the diaphragm have null movement. That means that the any movement of the diaphragm is compensated by applying a force from the other side such that it goes back to the force required here is directly related to the pressure and the area of cross section as you can see. When the pressure and the area of multiply the area of cross section is exactly equal to the force applied, there will be no movement of the diaphragm. In this case, I am using what is called a force balance element in which I am making, I am applying a force in the opposite direction such that the displacement is completely null. Let us take a look at the case of the fluid being a compressible fluid, for example, air inside the system. The uh, the pressure chamber here and the coupling tube is full of that air and now if you see what is happening there is no change in the volume because I am, uh, I am nullifying whatever displacement that may take place. When the pressure is different, when the pressure changes immediately I am putting a force such that that pressure is nullified. Okay? So, that means there is no change in the volume, but you remember from the equation of state for a gas that P equal to rho R T because pressure, density, temperature they are all related. If the pressure changes, the density of the liquid fluid has to change. So, if the density of the fluid changes, some mass transfer mass, mass must go from the chamber to the through the pipe into the chamber into the pressure gauge such that the density increases. Okay. Let us look at the uh, <coughs> this case in some detail by working out what is going to happen in the case of a force balance element. This is another way of using the pressure transducer, where we are going to make the displacement of the spring element is always 0, instead of allowing it to displace I am going to keep it this thing. So, let us identify the potential for the change in the density is pressure. And uh, the mass of gas within the in the transducer is equal to rho into V and uh, V is a constant, it is a constant, there is no change in the volume. Therefore, rho is going to change when you have a different pressure when the pressure changes in the chamber, the density of the fluid has to change. That means, to make the density more, some amount of mass has to transfer just like in the previous case. Let us assume that this change in density, we will assume that it takes place, take place through a polytropic process. <coughs> so, what is this polytro polytropic process? This is a concept from thermodynamics. We will assume that the pressure and the density change according to the relationship P by rho to the power of n equal to constant, n equal to 1 corresponds to isothermal if the temperature remains fixed throughout we can assume n equal to 1, n equal to gamma the ratio of specific heats if it is a isentropic process
and in general it may be anywhere in between these two values n equal to 1 and n equal to gamma. And uh, let us look at the problem this way. We are interested in finding out the transient response of the system or estimate the time constant for the system assuming that it is going to be a first order system which we will show in a little while from now because this is no different from the previous case. So, we expect it to be a first order system we want to estimate the time constant and for estimation process it does not matter what value of n you are going to assume it is going to come typical value will be of the order of magnitude which we are going to determine from this. Therefore, from the purely from the utility point of view I can either take n equal to 1 or gamma or any value in between it does not it is not going to make much of a difference. That means, that the actual process undergone by the gas as it flows through the from one side to the other side is not very important for this particular purpose. So, let us look at this p by rho to the power of n equal to constant I can differentiate logarithmically. So, what I do is log p minus n log rho equal to constant constant is now logarithm of that I am just taking the log of that your logarithmic differentiation will give you d p by p equal to n d rho by rho n d rho by rho why, why do I am why calculate this you will see that the mass inside is rho v and uh, again I can logarithmic differentiate d m by m equal to d rho by rho since v equal to constant d m by m the change in the mass to the mass which is already there is simply related to the change in the density as a ratio of the density rho itself. So, that is what gives rise to that. So, you you can now see that if I go back d p by p equal to n d rho by rho I can also write it as d p by d rho equal to n p by rho n p by rho. So, the capacity of the or the capacitance I can take it as the ratio the d m by d p this is the capacitance of the gauge. So, d m by d p I can write it using the previous expression. <coughs> I can write it as d m by d rho times d rho by d p I am just uh, using the definition of c and uh, if you go back to the previous one I already have d p by d rho here equal to n p by rho. So, I am going to substitute here d p by d rho is d m by d rho into d p by d rho is n p by rho. So, this goes like this. So, the capacitance is determined by this expression. <coughs> we also remember that p is equal to rho r g t where r g is the gas constant this is the equation of state so using the equation of state p equal to rho r g t so p by rho is equal to r g into t so we can see that d p by d rho c will be equal to d m is not v v d rho so v d rho by d rho this becomes v d m by d rho is nothing but v because d m m equal to rho v. So, this becomes v d rho by d p d m by d rho m equal to rho v therefore, this becomes rho into 
v, v is constant I take it out dm by d rho becomes v because rho is constant. So, this becomes v d rho by d p is nothing but v into d rho by d p will give you r v d rho by d p will give you 1 over n r g t. This is your expression for c. So, I can write the time constant without going through the intermediate steps. Tau is time constant is the product of r and c. r is already known to us once the length of the tube is given, the diameter of the tube is given and the fluid is given, we can calculate the resistance of the coupling element that multiplied by c which is just now determined. So, r into v divided by n into gas constant times t. So, this is your term. So, in the problem which I just posed before we took a look at this is this. So, we have a, a null element or the force balance element and the diameter of the tube is 2 mm, length is 2.5 meters and then we have a volume of 5 ml which is the constant in this case and then the air is at 1.2 bar 30 degree Celsius. I want to find out the time constant system exactly the calculation which I just indicated now has to be performed for this and uh, let us do that on the board. So, the example 26 which requires the calculation R which goes here and we require the capacitors. If we calculate these two our job is essentially accomplished. So, let us look at the steps of doing that it is a very straightforward thing. So, the volume of the transducer is given is 5 millimeters 5 into 10 to the power of minus 6 cubic meter everything I will use in SI units so that there is no confusion. So, we have the volume given then the pressure is specified as 1.2 bar 1.2 in 10 to the power of 5 Pascal because 1 bar is exactly equal to 10 to the power of 5 Pascal. The temperature is given as 30 degrees. So, I have to add 273 to make it equal to the absolute temperature in Kelvin because everything requires use of temperature absolute temperature because we are using thermodynamic equations and they require that to be done that way. And the gas constant for air is 287 joules per kg Kelvin these are the things which we already know. And in fact as I mentioned earlier we can take you make use of a polytropic process and for the sake of if you take n if you remember what happened in the previous uh, expression here we are having n in the denominator. So, if I use a value of n equal to 1 I get the overestimate for tau because tau will be largest for n equal to 1 and tau will be smallest if the process happens to be isentropic. Therefore, I will be getting an overestimate or the upper bound for the time constant. <coughs> so, let us assume that the upper bound is adequate for us. So, I will take n equal to 1 which is a polytropic process with the n equal to 1 is nothing but an isothermal process which is also possible if the entire thing is <coughs> well exposed to the outside ambient the temperature more or less is going to remain constant. So, we can justify this to some extent and therefore, it is also possible to say that the time the time constant will be the largest possible value because isothermal conditions more probably are going to apply to this particular case. So, with this we can calculate the capacitance C is nothing but V divided by N R G T F R G times T times N equal to 1 I have taken. So, V is 5 into 10 to the power of minus 6 divided by 287 303 this will give you a value of 
5.75 into 10 to the power of minus 11 meter second square. This is the unit of the capacitance, unit of the capacitance. In of course, electrical engineering or electronics, electrical circuit, it will be farad or microfarad, but here the unit is going to be, it is a mechanical unit because it is the meter second square. C is equal to 5.75 into 10 to the power of minus 11 meter second square. The calculation of the resistance is similar to what we did in the example 5, example 20, 25. So, R is calculated as in example 25 and therefore, I do not want to repeat the calculation. All you have to do is to calculate the viscosity and the density for the air at 1.2 bar and, 10 to the, and uh, 30 degrees Celsius. So, you have to look up the tables giving air properties and then evaluate the value of R. So, I leave it uh, to the student should do this using the example 25 in the previous lecture as a guide you can do that and uh, we can calculate R as 8.535 into 10 to the power of 7, the units will be 1 over meter second. And therefore, the tau, the time constant is R c will be product of the two quantities, the c in the previous slide and whatever is given here, it will be product will come out to be 4.907 into 10 to the power of minus 3 second or 4.907 millisecond or roughly equal to 5 milliseconds. So, the pressure transducer has a time constant, it is a five first order system, it is a five time constant given by 5 millisecond. So, this is the first part of the question which is answered by determining the time constant. Now, we want to find out if uh, it will be useful for a signal which is varying at 100 hertz. 100 hertz means per second 100 cycles of variations are going to take place and therefore, the period is equal to 1 over 100, 1 over 100 or 0.01 second or 100 milliseconds. I am sorry, I think it is 10 milliseconds, right? 10 milliseconds, okay. 10 milliseconds, it is going to be 10 milliseconds. So, if you remember what we discussed earlier when we were talking about the first order system and it responds, when we were talking about a temperature sensor, we mentioned that the time constant of the system must be at least the ratio of the characteristic time of the signal current compared to the thing at least must be a factor of 5 or 10. Here it is not satisfying that requirement. Therefore, we can say that the 100 hertz signal, when you have a 100 hertz signal, it is not going to be all right to use this particular. So, it will not follow, it will not be useful. We cannot use this transducer or the dimensions which are given. It can be due to two things, the coupling element, the resistance is one thing and the second one is the capacitance. By reducing either one of them, we can improve the response of the system. For example, I will have to for a 100 hertz uh, a signal which is going to be input, I require a smaller diameter for the or the smaller volume for the transducer the volume is 5 milliliter which is very large, 
if you can reduce that it is going to improve the uh, situation or you can improve the you can reduce the length of the coupling element or increase the diameter of the coupling element but the most important here will be the volume if you can increase you can, you can decrease the volume of the uh, pressure transducer which is held constant at whatever value we are given if you can reduce it it's going to certainly improve the matter so with this we come to our end of our discussion on the transient pressure measurement and now let us look at measurement of pressures which are varying with which are below the atmospheric pressure in many occasions and many applications we use vacuum pressures in many chemical instruments which are used in chemistry chemical analysis or physical analysis and so on it is necessary to remove or reduce the gases which are present and that can be done by pulling a vacuum and uh, you would like to measure the vacuum pressure which will be of course below the atmospheric pressure if you use a mercury in a youtube manometer to measure vacuum the best you can do is to it goes to 760 mm of mercury or whatever the atmospheric pressure is it will go and get stuck there so we cannot measure very small values we can only measure a rough value for the vacuum okay if you want to improve the measurement how are we going to do that so the measurement of vacuum is an independent activity which is required in many applications and we would like to have instruments which can be used specifically for measuring vacuum pressures again there are several different types of vacuum measuring instrument vacuum pressure gauges one of them is a mcleod gauge and the subsequent ones i am going to discuss are going to be somewhat specialized gauges we will come to them as we progress so let us look at the mcleod gauge it is actually a manometer it is actually a manometer and it is also a compressor coupled into one so let us look at the construction of the mcleod gauge and we will be able to understand how it functions so vacuum to be measured is going to be communicated to this 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 uh, whole thing is the mcleod gauge along with the movable reservoir for a moment imagine that this movable reservoir is moved to a lower level so that this meniscus which is here is going to come to this level of the opening that is this reservoir is going to be moved down such that the level of the liquid in the reservoir, the reservoir as well as this portion of the gauge is at the level of the opening that means the vacuum to be measured which is coupled here is going to occupy the entire this whole thing which is shown here this whole thing is going to be completely encloses the medium at the vacuum pressure which is to be measured okay so suppose we assume that the volume of this bulb this capillary and this side tube everything put together is some volume vb so we have when uh, the level of the reservoir is brought down such that it is just at the opening some amount of the gas the residual gas in the vacuum chamber equal to some volume vb we will call it as vb is going to be trapped in this one and now slowly i move the reservoir up slowly i move the reservoir up so what happens the liquid level which is here at the opening level slowly rises and when it does so it traps a certain amount of gas in this portion which is at the original volume vb and slowly as i raise it that volume is going to be compressed to the volume above the meniscus here this is the volume above the meniscus this volume is given by the area of cross section of the capillary multiplied by the height oi here which is shown here and what i do is after bringing down to this level and then allowing the gas to occupy the entire region inside i'm going to move this reservoir slowly up such that it uh, the level comes to the standard reference level i have got a reference mark here so i will move it up so that the level is at this reference level so this meniscus this meniscus and this meniscus are all at the same level which is equal to the reference level 
when death happens the amount of gas which was inside is now compressed to higher pressure therefore this uh, region above the capillary is cup is uh, full of a uh, high pressure gas the pressure of the gas originally was equal to the vacuum pressure and after this process it has become a higher pressure which is equal to this and if i use mercury as the liquid which is doing the which is the which is contained in the moving reservoir and uh, here and here the difference y directly gives you the pressure of the gas which is compressed now which is above the meniscus in the capillary tube this pressure will be equal to the so many millimeters of mercury equal to y millimeters of mercury that is the pressure okay so the point is i am using the mcleod gauge to sample a certain volume of the gas equal to vb and i am going to perform an operation of compression to a higher pressure which is given by this height of the column here between here and here and let us see how this is going to take place the change if i assume that the temperature of the entire instrument is constant during this operation the process of compression is going to follow an isothermal process so that is the crux of the matter and before we go go to look at the appropriate uh, formula the range of this instrument is 10 to the power of minus 2 to 100 micrometer micrometer is micrometer of mercury or 0.001 to 10 pascals this is the range of pressures which we can measure using this instrument let us look at the way we are going to analyze this problem so initially i will just make a quick sketch here to indicate what is happening we have this and here is the opening this is the opening and uh, this is connected to the side tubes and so on so initially the level of the mercury is here and this whole thing is full of this is vb the volume is vb at pressure equal to p of the vacuum pressure initial pressure finally what is going to happen it is going to be up to this and uh, if you remember what we did there will be meniscus level will be here this is what is here. this is your way so the volume to begin with is vb final volume is y multiplied with the area of cross section we will assume that uh, area of cross section of the capillary tube is a times y so a is the cross section area of capillary before we proceed let us just see what are the dimensions we are going to use the volume of the bulb may be 100 cc 100 milliliters the diameter of the capillary may be half a millimeter therefore you see that we are talking about very small value of a and therefore this final volume is going to be very small compared to so ay is very small compared to vb now you see that this uh, pressure is p here and we will say this is the pressure in the capillary at the end of the process so during the isothermal process we have pv equal to constant so pc vc equal to p vb this is the isothermal process and uh, you also see that this is one equation we also know that final volume is vy 
V A Y, this is equal to nothing but V C, this is one expression we have. Thirdly, the difference between P and P C is nothing but so many millimeters of mercury Y. What I am going to do is, I am going to use everything in terms of millimeters of mercury. So, all pressures are in millimeters of mercury, which is also called a torque. Okay. So, these are the three equations I have. So, by P minus P C equal to Y or P equal to Y plus P C and then what I have to do is P C equal to P into V B by V C. So, I can eliminate P C from here by using second equation here and then manipulate. So, let us write it down. So, P minus P C equal to P minus P C V C equal to P B P V B. So, this will be P V B by V C because P C into V C is equal to P into V B. So, you can see that. Therefore, V C P C equal to P V B by V C. So, I can take P common factor into 1 minus V B by V C and uh, <coughs> this is equal to I can V C is nothing but A times Y you remember V C equal to A times Y. So, this becomes P into 1 minus V B by A Y and P minus P C is also equal to y that is from the manometer equation. So, p into 1 minus v b by a y equal to y or the pressure in the vacuum chamber is given by p equal to y divided by 1 minus v b by a y. <coughs> This will be you can multiply by a y the entire thing. So, this becomes a y squared divided by a y minus v b. I think we made a mistake somewhere. So, there is a <coughs> sign is not coming out right here. So, let us just see that one. this actually P C minus P this actually P C minus P equal to y not the other way and therefore, this is actually we will make a correction quickly this P C minus P equal to so this will be minus this will be plus so this will be plus this will be minus and therefore finally this will be minus this will be plus and I uh, will just make the correction here So, this becomes V B minus A Y and I can approximate if you remember I said this is very large compared to this volume I can simply say it is equal to A Y squared by V B or if I call this A by V B as the gauge constant k some k constant k times Y squared. So, the pressure of the vacuum chamber which is what we are trying to measure P is equal to k 
k times y square. It is a non-linear relationship between p and y and k is the gauge constant is equal to a by v b. A is the area of cross section of the capillary, v b is the volume of the bulb and the capillary and the capillary of course, is a very small volume we can ignore that. So, it is nothing but the area of cross section of the capillary to the ratio of area of capillary to the volume of the bulb. With this background let us just take one example and uh, work it out. This will be example 27 I think. So, we will we have just enough time to look at one. So, we will assume that we have a McLeod gauge the McLeod gauge is named after the inventor of the instrument. So, McLeod is the name of the person V B is given as 100 milliliters or cubic centimeters and capillary diameter we will call it as diameter of the capillary point 0.5 millimeter. And uh, we are also given that the value of y in a certain measurement was 2.5 centimeters of mercury. This is a particular case where we have made the measurement. So, I want to find out what is the corresponding p for this particular case or the vacuum pressure. So, all I have to do is to substitute the values into that it is very simple calculation. So, V b we will put everything in SI units to avoid confusion V b equal to 100 into 10 to the power of minus 6 cubic meters is equal to 10 to the power of minus 4 cubic meters and the area of cross section of the tube is pi into d c squared by 4. So, pi divided by 4 multiplied by 0 0.5 millimeters 0.5 into 10 to the power of minus 3 meter whole squared. This will give you 1.9635 into 10 to the power of minus 7 meter square. And uh, we also must put it in meters 2.5 centimeters which is divided by 100 to get the meters. So, with this let us substitute into the equation or you can calculate the gauge constant if you want and then calculate it. So, I will just say p is equal to a y squared by v b this is approximate because I am ignoring the minus y in the denominator. If you want you can take into account this will be 1.9635 into 10 to the power of minus 7 point 0 0.025 meters y is whole squared divided by v b is 10 to the power of minus 4 and I want p in millimeters of mercury. So, I will multiply it by 10 to the power of 3 because everything is in meters so many torque. So, this will come to 1.227 into 10 to the power of minus 3 torque or 1.227 milli torque. So, the pressure is 1.227 milli torque. And uh, if you remember the exact formula would, be, would have been P equal to A y square divided by V b minus A y. So, the error can be calculated by calculating this particular this quantity and comparing with the these two quantities if you compare you will be able to find out the error and in fact, I will leave this as a an exercise to be done by the student. The error comes out to be in percentage is 
into 10 to the power of minus 3 percent. A very small error and therefore, quite negligible. That means, that this is a good representation. You need not use this. You can use this directly p equal to a y squared by v b is a good enough approximation for calculating the pressure of the vacuum chamber. So, with this we have looked at one way of measuring the pressure in a vacuum chamber and let us just introduce other ways of doing it, so that we can take it up in the next lecture. So, let us look at the other gauges. The other gauges are required because vacuum can have we can classify vacuum into low vacuum, then high vacuum, then we have ultra high vacuum. As the at low vacuum, we are uh, talking about pressures below the atmosphere, and it could be anywhere from on the negative side from below the atmosphere, it could be anywhere up to minus 760 millimeters of mercury, that is 76 centimeters of mercury below the this thing. That means the pressure we are talking about is not very low. Then below that even if you go lower you get what is called high vacuum. In fact, in practice vacuum also requires the creation of vacuum requires different types of mechanical arrangements. We require different types of pumps vacuum pumps to create different levels of vacuum. Rough or low vacuum requires rotary vacuum pumps or reciprocating type vacuum pumps. And then if you want to go to higher vacuum pressures, you require instrument uh, 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 a thing is something like a diffusion pump, which uses the which, which is basically a method by which a condensing oil is going to trap the molecules and take it out of the atmosphere out of the chamber. Or you require for ultra high vacuum, you may require uh, using a cryogenic pump cryo pump or you may use gutter pumps which are actually uh, special uh, pumps which uh, evaporate a metal which will after evaporation is going to trap the gas and uh, take it away. So, the vacuum to be measured requires uh, it comes in different ranges and to cover the different ranges of course, we require different methods. And, uh, I have just indicated here the Pirani gauge, which uses essentially like what we had earlier the resistance thermometer idea. This is for not very high vacuum 0 0.1 to 100 Pascals, and then we have what is called an ionization gauge for much higher values, or we can use an alpha strand gauge. These are the three gauges I am going to discuss. What I will do is take it up in the next lecture. Thank you.